uh, love us, and that tonight we just want to hear from you. Uh, Father God, it's not always a fun night with Jeremiah and Lamentations, <laughs> but uh, Father, we just thank you that you would anoint me uh, and that you would give me the words to speak. And Father, open people's hearts, open my heart, just for new things and things that we haven't heard before. In Jesus' name, amen. So, yeah, it's not like a fun thing tonight. <laughs> Hi, Lula. How are you? Good. So I'm going to start. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. And you'll see why, because basically <laughs> he, he does cry a lot, but because he's in so much sadness and grief over what's happening. And so um, he probably, this was written, he wrote it, Jeremiah, he wrote it, between 630 and 580 B.C., which was sort of the time that he was called to um, prophesy to four different kings. And so we'll look at them. And he, remember, was in the southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom, you'll see here, um, when he started, actually was still not taken yet. So the northern kingdom was not in captivity yet either. Um, but by very soon into his um, ministry, they get taken captive. So the way the book is divided, but he mostly, almost, almost like, I'd say 90% of the book, he's prophesying to the southern kingdom. And then the last half of the book, he's prophesying to other nations around. Um, so chapters 1 through 45 is really about Judah, which is the southern kingdom, right? And then chapters 46 through 51 are the other nations. And then chapter 52 is sort of the very sad ending where it's talking about the fall of Jerusalem and um, what next. So the major events there... Um, we're going to look at Jeremiah as a man, and we're actually going to spend a pretty good amount of time on that. But he actually was born into the priesthood. So he actually was born into a family of priests, but yet God called him very specifically, called him in chapter 1 um, to be a prophet. Prophesized to four kings, as I said. The gist of this book, and I think why it's so sad, <laughs> is because it's really about a nation that is under under judgment, right? And so there's a lot you could sort of read it about our own country right now because it really is about um, how many times, you know, God says, you're doing, if you just turn you know, from your sin, if you just repent, if you just do this. That's literally what he does the whole first 40 chapters. Um, but really it's about national sin and national disobedience and then the consequences of that. So the next slide is this one. I like. I don't know. Maybe you guys don't like them, but I like them. The one from um, Chuck Swindoll. And it just, again, gives sort of a nice picture. The theme is about judgment coming and that they should repent. Um, and then uh, he also looks at some, where, where is Jesus when we get to the end of this? So who is Jeremiah? That's the next slide. Um, basically, I'm going to read from chapter 1. And basically it says, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth, in the territory of Benjamin. So we already know his dad is Hilkiah, who was a priest. And generally that's the priesthood, right? That's being gone down. So we know he's in this lineage of a priesthood. And he lives in the territory of Benjamin, which is the southern kingdom. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Am Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So remember the kings. Josiah in the southern kingdom was really one of the last good kings. And so here's Josiah, and it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah. So Josiah was the first king that he prophesied to or was starting his ministry under, and he was the last good king. And then Jehoiakim was a nasty guy, and we'll see him a lot because he did not like Jeremiah one bit, and he did a lot of things to Jeremiah um, because he didn't like what he was saying. And then it basically says he goes through Zedekiah, and Zedekiah was the king who was the king when the captivity actually happened. And he has a horrible end. 
and so we'll look at that tonight. So verse 4 then says, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And of course, I love that verse. Because that's for all of us, right? That's the same thing it says in Psalm 139. I knew you in the womb. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. And he's saying, I have a plan for you, right? And I knew you. I wove you together even, um, even before you were born, when I was creating you. Well, the one in Psalm 139, the whole, the whole psalm is about that. But this one is Jeremiah 4, 5. 1, 5, I'm sorry. 1, 4, and 5. <laughs> That's me. No, no, I want you to correct me. Yes. And then he says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So very clearly, he says, you're not just a priest. You are now a prophet to the nations. And so he is... Um, you know, got this beautiful call here. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and whatever I command you to do. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. And so I just want to point out again, we just talked about this, and I, I'm sorry to say this, I can't remember who it was, but just because people are young, <laughs> He got called, and they actually think he was probably 17 to 20 years old when this happened to him. So he was a young guy, and God is, he says, like, I can't speak, you know, who, oh, it was Job's friend, who, who was the younger guy that came in later, and he said, I didn't want to interrupt people because I'm just a young guy, like, how could I possibly say this? And God is basically saying very clearly, do not say, I am only a child. You must go everywhere I send you. Do not be afraid. And then... The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. So he had a very specific sort of anointed calling. And the last person in Isaiah, remember in Isaiah 6, he was, in, he was seeing a vision of heaven or was in heaven, and the angel put the coal to his mouth and said, you know, because he said, like, I'm so unholy, like I can't be in your presence. And the angel touches his mouth, and that's basically to cleanse him of sin. And then I thought, look at this. This isn't an angel. This says, the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me. So he, he <laughs> sees God, is with God, and God touches his mouth. I just think that's unbelievable. So um, that's sort of the first, in the first all in the first chapter. So then he says in, chapter, in uh, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And the Lord said, well, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Meaning the word was like an almond tree. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, what do you see? And he said, I see a boiling pot, and it is facing away from the north. And this is where the Lord says, out of the north, calamity shall break forth, on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. I will utter my judgments against them concerning their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshiped the works of their hands. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you, do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. And he's basically saying, the kingdom of the north, right? So Assyria is coming to take captive the, um, don't do that anymore, okay? Thank you. I got your hint. So the, the, the northern kingdom is coming, or the northern kingdom is being um, overtaken by Assyria. But they also come and they try and take over the, over, the, over the southern kingdom. But God, this is where God sent that angel and basically said, no, you're not going to take the southern kingdom. So he's telling Jeremiah, and we'll look a little bit later, there were many, many prophets that all overlapped, right? So every prophet um, 
they, they're pretty much all there together, either in the northern or the southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom's about to be taken over, but he says in the last verse there, in uh, verse 19, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you to deliver you. So God is telling him, even though they're going to come against you, don't worry about it. So another piece of Jeremiah, he actually, we said he began his ministry during the reign of King Hosea, but he was also a mourner at his funeral. And if you look at 2 Chronicles 35, it actually shows a little verse here. It says, when Josiah died, everyone mourned for him, and he was very um, popular, and people loved him. But it says, Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. And at the time, sometimes they actually hired mourners. I don't know if he was hired or not, but he also was definitely lamenting when King Josiah died. Um, the next thing about Jeremiah, and this skips to chapter 16, I'm going to sort of go through this a couple different ways, but this skips to chapter 16. God actually forbid him to get married. And in chapter 16, 1 through 4, it says, The word of the Lord also came to me, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. Thus says the Lord, concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them, and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths, they shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the field. So he's saying to them, him, do not get married, do not have any children, because it is not going to go well in this, when, when this captivity happens. Right, exactly. I mean, like, this sounds horrible. I mean, it sounds atrocious. And so um, God tells him in chapter 16, and remember, he was a young guy, but he was so obedient to God. Like, some of the things we're going to look at later, he did were a little bit crazy, but... Um, and then he was a very, very unpopular minister and a, an unpopular person because everything he was telling people, like he never got any acceptance from anyone. So for years, he literally was a prophet for about 80, 60, 60 or 70 years. And everyone hated him. Like there was no, like hardly anybody on his side. He was rejected by people. He was hated. He was beaten. He was put in stocks. He was imprisoned, and then later on, we'll look at it, he was actually accused of being a traitor, of all things, because here he was, like, standing up for the righteous, you know, righteousness of God, and he's being accused of being a traitor and a, and a liar. And then in chapter 20, um, he, we have this little experience, and it says, Now Pashur, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord. So this guy is a priest, okay? heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. And Pashur struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it happened on the next day he came and took him out of the stocks. But here's a priest. When Jeremiah is prophesying, he hits him, and then he puts him in stocks overnight. It says, uh, it happened on the next day he came and got him out of stocks, and Jeremiah basically said to him, the Lord has not called your name Pasher any longer, but Magor Misabib. And it means fear on every side. And so Jeremiah basically called this guy out too and said, I'm not the guy that's in trouble here. You are, right? So for thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall. And he's saying this to Pasher. I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of your enemies. Your eyes shall see it. We will give all of Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. So this is a, the statement. You are going to be taken into captivity, and it will not go well. Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all its produce, all its precious things, all the treasures of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hands of their enemies who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, all who dwell in your house, shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die and be buried, and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. 
So he just totally calls this guy out. And that's what you see him doing. And he does it to various people. And he does it to various kings. And so when you're in sin and someone is calling out your sin or telling you things, you don't always receive it very well, right? So just something to think about. So then um, Jeremiah, his, his ministry was unpopular. We talked about that. And I just looked um, in chapter 20 further down. It says, this is what Jeremiah says. Everyone has mocked me. I am a reproach. I get derided daily. Um, your word is burning in, in my heart like a fire. I'm tired of trying to hold it back because of ridicule and because of um, people mocking me on every side. And he says, all my acquaintances watch for me stumble, to stumble and for me to be deceived. And he says, but we will prevail against him. And we will, they say about him, well, we're going to prevail against him anyway. Like his friends are all basically just totally, you know, cutting him off. And then he calls them his persecutors. So this guy just has no, just nothing, no good fortune. <laughs> and then he finally says, again, sort of like Job, in verse 14, it says, Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. And that's how low he got. That's how depressed he was over all these things and all these people harassing him um, because he was speaking the truth and the word of God. And so, you know, Larry and I talk a lot about, like, some people are sort of on the side of, you know, there's going to be great revival in America right now, and there's going to be great revival. And some people are on the side of, like, it ain't, there ain't going to be no revival. <laughs> like, it is not looking good for our country, and we have to turn from our sin. Because if we don't turn from our sin, God has to judge us, right? So at the very end of Jeremiah then, um, he actually sees the destruction of Jerusalem, and he sees the uh, Babylonian captivity. And basically, at the very end even, once they're taken captive, he there's a remnant, a small remnant that's left in the southern kingdom. And they basically say to him, well, what should we do? What should we do? And he says, you need to su submit, basically, and just go into captivity with them. Because if you don't, it's not going to go well for you, which is not what they want to hear, right? And so they basically say, we're going to go to Egypt. And he says, God says very clearly in chapter 42, do not go to Egypt because they are idol worshipers. Do not go to Egypt. And what do they do? They go to Egypt. And they take Jeremiah with them and Baruch, who is his scribe. And so Jeremiah gets taken into Egypt. And from what I could see and what I could read, it doesn't say it in here uh, in the word that I could find, but it basically sounds like he was stoned while he was in Egypt by the remnant. Not by the Egyptians, but by the remnant of the people that were Jewish. So it's a horrible, <laughs> like the guy is just one of those guys, you're just like, how much really can a person take? You know, like how much can one person take when he's standing up for righteousness? So I want to look then, so that was sort of him as a person. I want to look then at the judgments against Judah, which is, I call it the human videos. <laughs> Because I always liked that when we did that. Uh, we used to have human videos, you know, where the kids would do that in fine arts. And I always loved those. They're sort of like parables, right? They're, they're human videos is what I called them. But he's got numerous times or uh, little stories or vignettes that God said to him, I want you to do this. And the whole point was that it represents some picture of something. So the first one I wanted to look at was the linen sash. And that's in Jeremiah 13. And so up until now, Jeremiah has been called, and he basically has already started prophesying, um, you know, against the southern kingdom and people, you've got to repent. So in chapter 13 in Jeremiah 1 through 11, he says, go get yourself a linen sash and put it around your waist, but don't put it in water. So I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, take the sash you got which is around your waist, and go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a hole in the rock. And I thought, 
that's so weird because the Euphrates is like up in Babylon. Like the Euphrates River is in Babylon, right? That's where I think it is. So, and I actually was going to look, but I forgot. But that's where I think it is. He says, so go hide it there and put it in a hole in the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Now it came to pass after many days that the Lord said, now arise and go to the Euphrates and take the sash back out. I went to the Euphrates and dug it out, and I took the sash from the place where I had hidden it, and there it was, ruined. It was profitable for nothing. And then the word of the Lord came to me and said, this is the manner in which I will ruin the pride of Judah. So he had this beautiful sash. He hid it in Babylon, I think, and then he comes back to get it, and God basically said, this is what your country is going to be like. It's going to be ruined. So he has this little word picture. And it says, for, for as the sash clings to the waist of a man, I have caused the whole house of Israel and the house of Judah to cling to me, that they may become my people, but they would not hear. So that's sort of the first picture. The next one is called the symbol of the wine bottles. And this is also in Jeremiah 13, and it's just 12 through 14. He says, therefore, you shall speak to them this word. So God always is saying to him, this is the words I want you to speak. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do we not certainly know that every bottle will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of the land, even the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, I will not pity nor spare or have mercy on them, but will destroy them. So it's just another word picture. He's using these bottles of wine. Um, then in chapter, four, uh, chapter 15, he says uh, in verse 1, The Lord said to me, Even if Moses and, Stan and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable for these people. So he's almost like even if people were interceding for these people, it's not. I'm not going to... Um, I, I'm not going to, I, I have to cast them out because of their sin. And then in chapter 18, he has a picture, this parable of the potter's wheel. And this is 18, 1 through 6. And he basically says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house. I will cause you to hear my words. So I went to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel, right? So they're sitting there, he's sitting there spinning. He sees this person. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. You know, have you ever seen that where they sort of smash the whole thing and then they start all over again and start remaking it? And he says, um, it seemed good to the potter to make a new one. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look as the clay is in the potter's hands, so you are in my hand, house of Israel. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, or to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent its disaster. So God is saying, like, if they just repent, if they just repent, if they just repent, I'll do it. Because he loves us, right? He loves us, and he wants us to repent. But basically, at the end, he says, uh, behold, I am now fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil ways. So, again, God is, you know, basically saying, um, I'm, I'm, it's just not going to go well. And then chapter 19, he has the broken flask. And this is another one where he says, go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and go to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. So he's telling Jeremiah, go to this gate, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants. Behold, I will bring a catastrophe on this place, that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle. Because they have forsaken me, this is an alien place. They have burned incense to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers nor their kings of Judah have filled this place. They've built high places to Baal. They burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings. So they're not just doing like little sins, right? They're, they're in, way down deep into the, the bad sin. 
um, they're doing child sacrifice now, basically. And therefore, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no longer be called Tophet or Valley of the Son of Hinnom, but it will be called the Valley of Slaughter. Yikes. That is not good. So that's just another sort of word picture here. And then the next one um, I found, it was Jeremiah 24. It's called the Two Baskets of Figs. It says, the Lord showed me, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem. One basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe, and on the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten because they were so bad. And he says, what do you see, Jeremiah? And he says, I see figs. I see good figs, and I see very bad, bad, very bad figs, which cannot be eaten. They are so bad. And again, God says to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Jerusalem, whom I have set out for their own good, for I will set my eyes on them that are good. And then he says, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. So he sort of says, here's the good figs, right? And they, he has a very precious statement there. He says, I will give them a heart to know me. I will be their God. They will be my people, and they will return to me. So he knows that there are people who will return. And then in verse 8, he has the bad figs. And as the bad figs, which cannot be eaten because they're so bad, so I will give up Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem, who remain in the land. I will deliver them to trouble. I will send the sword, famine, pestilence, etc. And we're going to see at the end, when Zedekiah gets taken captive, it's very bad. And then another picture in chapter 27, it's sort of yokes and bonds, and it says 27, 1 through 3. It says, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, so we have a new king, right? Josiah has died. Jehoiakim is the new king, and he is, jo he is Josiah's son, but he is, not a good, he is not a good son. He's not a good king. And he says, thus says the Lord to me, make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. He's saying this to Jeremiah. And send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre the king of Sidon, by the hand of the messengers who came to Jerusalem to Zedekiah. So these, he basically is going to end up um, prophesying against all these other kingdoms. And the reason he's prophesying against them is because they had actually come to try and help at one point, but he says none of that, not going to go there. And then in chapter 28, we have this guy named Hananiah. And Hananiah is a false prophet. And he also, it says he predicts the captivity, but only he says, yeah, we're going to go into captivity. Yes, we're going to get taken, but it's only going to be for two years. So don't worry about it. It's not going to be a big deal. And he tells all the people this, and he tells, I think it's um, Jeho Jehoiakim at the time. And so, of course, they want to believe that because who wants to believe you know, anything worse. And the prophet Jeremiah then goes his own way, and he basically says, the word of the Lord then came to Jeremiah after Hananiah had broken the neck of the yoke from the neck. So he had a yoke around his neck. Hananiah comes to basically say, oh yeah, you're going to go into captivity. He's right, but it's only for two years. And then he takes the yoke off of Jeremiah Jeremiah goes away, and God says to Jeremiah, he is a false prophet, he is lying, it's going to be for 70 years. And so Jeremiah, of course, once he hears the word of the Lord, he goes back to the people and he says, this guy is a false prophet, <laughs> he's a liar, it's really going to be for 70 years. And of course, they don't like that. They don't like that at all. So he says to Hananiah, hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make, this pe you make the people trust in a lie. Therefore, says the Lord, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. 
And Hananiah the prophet died the same year. It doesn't say how, but God basically says, no. <laughs> not gonna, if you're going to talk about captivity, then let's talk about the right thing. And then in chapter 37, um, there's a guy named Arijah. And he confronts and arrests Jeremiah and basically um, for saying, this is the guy that basically falsely accuses Jeremiah. And he says um, in verse 3, this is chapter 37, verse 3, when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of, captain of the guard was there whose name was Arijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah. So Hananiah was just the guy that was the false prophet. So his grandson, Arijah, is the guy that comes and falsely accuses Jeremiah. He says he sees Jeremiah and says, you are defecting to the Chaldeans. And Jeremiah said, false, I am not defecting to the Chaldeans. Do not listen to him. So Arijah seizes him and brings him into captivity. So the, the guy just never gets a break. Every single time, he, he's prophesying not good news. He never gets a break. And then finally, uh, the prophecy against Egypt and some of the other countries, in they, this is where God had said to them, don't go into Egypt, the remnant, don't go into Egypt, do not do that. And it says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah when he was in Egypt. Okay, he's already been taken. And he says, take two large stones in your hand and hide them in the sight of the men of Judah, so the people that had come with him, in the clay in the brick courtyard, which is at the entrance to Pharaoh's house. So he's telling him, take these two stones and hide them in this temple of the Pharaoh. And, he's, and he said, and let the Jews see that you're doing that, because he wanted them to see. And he says, behold, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and he says this several times, my servant, and I will set his throne above those stones that I have hidden. So he's basically saying, you may go to Egypt, but Egypt is also going to get taken by Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonian Empire ends up being humongous, right? It goes from, like, where is Iran today, Iraq, the whole Arabian Peninsula, and then into Egypt. It's huge. And this is where he prophesies Egypt is not going to, they're also going to get um, taken into captivity. I don't know if they get taken into captivity, but they will get overrun by Nebuchadnezzar. My servant, which I just think is very interesting. <laughs> and then he says, I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt. He shall burn them and carry them away captive. So he does take them into captivity. And then he says to the Jews that are in Egypt, a small number who escaped the sword shall still return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. So I think there's even a smaller number. So it's a small number that goes into captivity, and it's an even smaller number that comes back to Judah when they come back from Egypt. And this shall be a sign to you that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for advers adversity. So God has this whole thing mapped out. <laughs> And poor Jeremiah is the guy that <laughs> is sent to, to say all this to people. And he just gets, you know, completely whooped. Um, I think he's probably very depressed. It does, I mean, he continues to be obedient. He continues to do everything God tells him to do. Like, you just have to admire the guy. He's so obedient and, and just never gets a break. So... And then some of Jeremiah's punishments, I just showed you a few. I've talked about several of them. But he says, I feel like a lamb to the slaughter. He's persecuted. He's put in stocks. He's whipped. He's attacked by mobs. And then um, in King, under King Zedekiah, where it talks about um, Jeremiah 33, 1 through 3, this is where um, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time, while he was still shut up in the court, and God basically said, Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty, mighty things in which you do not know. And that's sort of a scripture, I think, that people like to say and like to use. And then in chapter 33, a little bit later, in um, chapter 14 through 18, 
it's God says, Behold, the days are coming that I will perform a good thing, which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. And that's one of the names of the Lord, Jehovah Sidkenu, which means the Lord our righteousness. And so that is from Jeremiah, <laughs> who doesn't see a lot of righteousness. But this is a messianic promise. This is a promise of Jesus, right? This is where he's saying, I will raise up a branch of righteousness, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. He's not just talking about, I'm going to bring a remnant back to um, Judah. He's also talking about, I'm going to bring the Messiah. So any questions on poor little Jeremiah? Poor guy. Huh? It is rough. And then the next slide, I put this in only because I thought this to me was just fascinating. I, I like to look at the timelines. The little tiny one up, you can't hardly read that at all. But the one that I just thought was really interesting, the, Jeremiah started his ministry about 6, did I say 630 B.C., something like that, under King Josiah. But if you look at this, in 605 B.C., the other thing that was happening, so this was before, you know, like chapter 42 and all that stuff. But basically what was happening was, this is when General Nebuchadnezzar, he was not King Nebuchadnezzar yet. General Nebuchadnezzar was trying to overtake Babylon, or was trying to overtake Egypt, but he did not succeed this time. So this was the first time he tried to overtake Egypt. He did not succeed. And so what he did, or yeah, Pharaoh Necho, so Egypt was actually trying to overtake Babylon, so Pharaoh Necho is trying to march against, ba uh, against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, um, they don't win. Egypt does not win this battle. And so in the meantime, ne Nebuchadnezzar goes back to Egypt. And that's, or goes back to, I'm sorry, goes back to Babylon. And then this is when he starts looking at taking Jerusalem. So it's like he couldn't get the whole way to Egypt. Egypt tried to come against him. He, didn't, he couldn't get the whole way to Egypt. So this is when he starts looking at the southern kingdom. And he starts taking um, the first siege on Jerusalem, which was in 605 B.C. And basically, this was during the King Jehoiakim's reign. And if you look in Daniel, this is when Daniel was in Jerusalem at the same time, and he and his friends were taken into captivity. So they all overlap. So Daniel was in the southern kingdom at the same time as Jeremiah. And I have a slide a little bit later. It shows there's a lot of prophets that are in that are in there. So he was not the only person in there trying to prophesy against, you know, try to repent, you know, let's <laughs> turn this around. I didn't I know I didn't say that very well. So, but this is when Daniel was taken captive and I just thought that was really interesting. So, if you look at I'm trying to read this under Jehoiakim. Yeah, it's like the first deportation. Remember, the first time they came to Jerusalem, when Babylon came to Jerusalem, they sort of became these, this vassal state, and you'll see this in Jeremiah too, where they weren't necessarily taken captivity, but they had to be doing what, what Nebuchadnezzar sort of said. <laughs> and this is also when Zedekiah, the last king, he actually was renamed, and he was actually, I think, almost appointed by Nebuchadnezzar because he was going to be like a puppet, but it didn't work out like that. So Zedekiah was the last king, yeah, and he was Jehoiachin's uncle. So Jehoiakim was the king. He was one of the kings. He had a son, Jehoiachin, who was in power for like three months, so he doesn't count. <laughs> and then... Um, and then after that, Mataniah, and then he was renamed Zedekiah. 
by Nebuchadnezzar. So Zedekiah is sort of this weak, you know, sort of puppet uh, king. But he did allow um, Jeremiah a little bit of grace. And so he was told by Nebuchadnezzar, which I thought was very interesting, Nebuchadnezzar actually told the people when they were taking over this Jerusalem for the first time, he sort of said, let Jeremiah live. Let him alone, like don't do anything to him. This is Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar had just taken Daniel and his friends, I think not thinking they were prophets by any means, but just taking them because they were young men and he wanted eunuchs to serve in the land. But um, I think he ended up taking uh, Jeremiah and he gave him under the, he put another guy in charge of Jerusalem at the time. His name was Gedaliah. And Nebuchadnezzar had made him sort of a governor over the land. Even though there was still this king over the people, he actually had his own governor. And his name was Gedaliah. And Gedaliah basically was the one that said to Jeremiah, just keep your mouth shut and just go along with things and things could go well for you. And he tried to almost like protect him a little bit. But it didn't last because Gedalia was actually murdered. And so as soon as he was murdered, then um, people were after Jeremiah again. And then that's when this remnant fled to Egypt and they took Jeremiah with them. So I think the one thing, I, two things I want to talk about here. In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, I actually want you to look at that. So Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 this is where we have the promise of a new covenant. And he basically says, behold, this is the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, which I'll talk about in a minute. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for everyone's going to know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So what a fantastic covenant, right? So a covenant, remember, is what? I mean, this is a thick bond. This is a commitment. This is, we're not turning back. Um, Abraham had a covenant with God. Moses had a covenant with God about blood. You know, Abraham the, um, got the covenant of, you know, I'm going to bless you beyond the number of your stars. And uh, I mean, just and then Moses has a covenant where he says, like, you've got to circumcise people. You have to shed blood. We had the Passover. So there are different covenants. And here in the middle of all this sin, God says to Jeremiah, I am going to give them a new covenant. And this is absolutely a picture. Yeah, it's your heart. It's not going to be the laws. It's not going to be stone and tablet. He says, I'm going to write this on your heart. And I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so it's clearly, to me, a picture of Jesus, right? So it, this is a picture of Jesus. This is a picture of our Savior, that we have a new covenant in the New Testament. We have a new covenant because Jesus is that, is that promise. And then in Luke 22, 14 through 20, now it was, it was I'll say, Easter weekend, Dusty. It was Easter weekend last weekend, and when you start looking at Easter week, right, we were talking about it because I grew up Presbyterian, and so we, we I wouldn't say celebrate, but we always had a, we called it a Maundy Thursday service, and you took communion because Maundy Thursday was the night that Jesus was betrayed, and it was a very solemn night, and the point was, at the beginning of that night, what was going on? Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples. He was being a servant with the person that was about to betray him, right? And then he says, um, now we're going to go to the garden and we're going to pray. 
and that's where then obviously he was betrayed. But we were trying to figure out if you're Presbyterian, how do you get to the three days? <laughs> like that's what we were trying to count. Like what are the three days? I said, well, maybe it was really Monday, Wednesday. I don't know. Like maybe we can't figure it out. But did you have a question or a comment? Oh, you. Yes, he was. He did. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't think people think about that. I think he totally washed his feet. That's me. He doesn't say that, but he was washing everyone else's feet, right? And Peter said, don't, if you're going to do that, don't just wash my feet, wash, wash all of me. But in Luke 22, it says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 disciples were with him. And he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. I believe he was speaking about Jeremiah's covenant. This is the covenant that Jeremiah was promised. And now Jesus is saying in Luke, This cup is the new covenant. These people only knew the Old Testament. They knew the scrolls of Jeremiah. They knew the scrolls of Isaiah. And I just think that is like a powerful, powerful um, thing right there. So I think Jesus, it's Jesus' way of saying, I, I am the fulfillment, right? I am the fulfillment of this. So even though I said many times Jeremiah didn't have any friends, he did have his life saved several times one of which was an, um, a high cam. And basically, a high cam just sort of spoke up for him. And he, uh, one of the kings, I believe it was Jehoiakim, um, was saying, I'm sick of this guy. Somebody go kill this guy. And this guy, Ahiakim, actually came to the king and said, no, wait a minute. Micah, Micah was also a prophet. And King Hezekiah got prophesied bad things too, but he didn't go kill the guy. So I think you shouldn't kill the guy. And so he didn't at that point. <laughs> and then another guy, um, Ebed Melech, this was in chapter 38, and this is where Zedekiah, remember, who was the last king, he basically says, the, Lord, uh, the king can do nothing against you. They took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son. So he's in a dungeon. It says, which is in the court of the prison. So he's in a prison in a dungeon, in a dungeon in a prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. I know. Like, this poor guy, you're just like, dude. Like, he would just want to give up. And it says, now Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. And I thought that was interesting. One of the eunuchs who was in the king's house heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. And when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, out, Ebed Melech went out of the king's house and spoke to him and saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they've done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they cast into the dungeon. He's going to die from hunger. There's no more bread in the city. Like th this place is in dire straits already. They already have no food. They have no bread. They're eating their, their children, some of them have said. And basically, um, the king commands him then, take 30 men and lift him up out of the mire. 30 men to get him out. Because he, I think he was so stuck in there. Like you see these pictures sometimes in Africa where there's like elephants stuck in a pit or there's animals that are stuck and they can't get out. And the more you try to get out, it's like quicksand almost. It's like mud and thick and you just can't get out. And I just wonder how deep he was in that. And so here's this Ethiopian eunuch that ended up taking, that pled for him, that sort of interceded for him. 
And he basically said, um, Ebed Melech took the men with him, the 30 men, and went to the house of the king under the treasury and took from there old clothes and rags and let them down by ropes into the dungeon. And he said, put these old clothes and rags under your armpits and under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon. And he remained in the court of the prison. Oh, bless you. I just, my heart just like goes out to this guy. Like I just can't even imagine what he went through. And then um, uh, basically, yeah. Um, the next part is the end. That was sort of like chapters 1 through about 45 or 44. And then in chapters 45 through 51, this is where he starts having all these other judgments against all these other people. And this is the picture of these are all the other prophets that were, there, that were overlapping with Jeremiah. And I just thought it was funny. They don't put Jeremiah in, but I put him in my little notes. So between 640 and 620, between Zephaniah and Ezekiel, that little space, that's where Jeremiah was. So Nahum had been prophesying. Jeremiah came in 650. I'm sorry, there he is. Zephaniah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, which we're going to talk about next week. Habakkuk, Obadiah. So these people <laughs> heard the word, right? They heard what they should be doing, and they just refused. They were so deep into sin. And I, you just cannot help, I'm sorry, but to look at our own country. You just can't help but look at our own country. Our country is deep in sin right now. And you do sort of look at it and go, I don't know if we can get out of this. Like, it is a mess. So, lots of contemporaries with Jeremiah. And, um, but he, he was obedient. He loved God. And then the last thing I want to talk about is this whole picture in Jeremiah of the, is God calls himself the wounded husband, and I would say the adulterous wife, right? Again, like, it's, God and Israel. It's that picture of God and Israel. So if you look at Jeremiah 3, um, verse 8, well, starting in verse 6, it says, During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on, she, so it's a, it's a woman, it's personified as a woman, she has gone up on every hill under every spreading tree and has committed adultery. I thought that after she, all she had done, she would return to me, but she did not. And her unfaithful sister, Judah. So he's sort of talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, but he's saying Israel was a harlot. That she had committed adultery. And then it says, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. And so, of course, what is the one sin that Jesus talks about with divorce? Adultery. Adultery. He basically does not give people an out for other sin except adultery. And so I just want to put that out there, that this is not a concept that Jesus maybe came up with on his own in the New Testament. This came from Jeremiah. And he basically said she was an adulteress. And that's why God gave her a, certific a certificate of, of divorce. That's what it says. She being Israel. And that's why they went into captivity. And so if you look at this as that picture of the wounded husband and the adulterous wife, because we're going to look at that again in another book, right? Hosea. And it says, in Jeremiah, God is shown as a wounded husband calling his bride to repent. Um, king Josiah, was he was like the last good king, but they had really gone down the road. They were doing sacrifices. They were destroying the temples. They had houses of prostitution. Jeremiah pled for them, cried for them. Jeremiah says that they need a new heart, a heart of flesh, which was the covenant. Um, and God says it will come. It will come, but certainly not at this time. 
And then the leaders of Israel, um, who were the remaining, as I said, bad kings, told the people that as long as the temple, this was another lie, they kept saying, well, the temple's still here. God hasn't left us. The temple's still here. Like, we're still the, we're still the place where people can worship God. But when Babylon came, the temple wasn't there anymore either, right? They, they, it got completely destroyed. And I actually think that's part of the reason why. Because the people kept saying, well, the religious, you know, like, I'm, I'm still going to church. Well, I'm still doing this. I'm still doing that. But that is not a heart covenant. <laughs> And then Jeremiah warned that they would be taken into captivity, um, and then finally they were. So I think it's just another picture of, of God and Israel. So where is Jesus in this book? I think just the picture of adultery and the bride, I think, is Jesus. Because that's all of us, right? We are all people who have sin. We are all people who have to repent every day. We are all people who has now a husband who loves us, who covers us, who protects us, if we allow him to do that. But if we continue in sin and we keep pushing him away, he's not going to do, he's not going to, you know, do anything differently. Um, there's several foreshadowings of Jesus here. The one that we talked about in Jeremiah 23, where it talked about the branch that was going to come from the house of David. They talked about a coming shepherd, which he is, and then um, the king of righteousness, uh, Jehovah Sidkenu, is certainly a picture of Jesus. And then the, there's another scripture that talks about the fountain of living waters. I actually want to look that up real quick. Jeremiah 2. See what that is. It says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. So he calls himself a spring of living water. Where else do we hear that? Obviously in the New Testament, right? The woman at the well. Yes. And then the whole picture of the new covenant in Luke, I just think is beautiful. So that is the poor prophet Jeremiah. Any comments or questions about him? Do you have anything on him, Dusty? <laughs> okay. Lamentations uh, is, goes, always goes with Jeremiah because what is Lamentations? <laughs> it's sad songs. That's basically what it is. Um, some people actually call it a eulogy. It's like a eulogy for the city of Jerusalem and for the southern kingdom. So most people agree that Jeremiah also wrote this, the weeping prophet, probably written toward the end of his time and probably... Some people say it was written maybe when he had already left Jerusalem and he was weeping over leaving it, uh, but when he was taken to Egypt. The way the book is divided, there's five chapters, and each chapter uh, we'll talk about is very separate, uh, and they're not necessarily in chronological order. <laughs> um, and we'll look at each one of these. And then the main characters are Jeremiah and then the city, the city itself, the city of Jerusalem. We have a picture of Charles Swindoll's little, um, next one, yeah, of the little, just how he divides it out, which I found very helpful. And then if you look at, um, I call them laments, but Lamentations 1, 2, and 3. So Lamentations 1 through, they're, they're interesting because some people, and I never get deep into this because I'm like, it's a little too much for me, but lots of people talk about sort of these hidden messages in the Bible, especially using the alphabet from the Hebrew language. But this is one of those things I thought, this is sort of interesting. <laughs> but um, the Book of Lamentations, all four, the first four, or one, two, three, and five, are called acrostic poems. They're all acrostic poems or songs of lament and what it means is the verses of each stanza begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So they're A, B, C, D, whatever those are in Hebrew. Each one of those things starts and it goes in order, and they're called acrostic poems. 
But the first chapter here is really where, again, Jerusalem is sort of personified as a woman, and she's called Daughter Zion, and she basically, um, again, it's just people weeping over her and saying, you know, how horrible it is and how sad they are, and, you know, uh, that's really what the whole thing is about. Four of these are 22 verses apiece, and then the one in the middle, the third one, is 66 verses. So it's like three times as much. The second lamentation is really about God's wrath. And, and I sort of looked this word up just to sort of say, this isn't anger. A lot of people actually say God's wrath is almost like God's justice or God's, God's sense of justice. He cannot tolerate sin because he's so holy. And so he cannot tolerate that. And so some people say God's anger or God's wrath. But when I looked it up, some people said it really means his justice, which I thought was interesting. And then um, Lamentations 3 is actually about a suffering man. It's really about Jeremiah. It's a man grieving um, on his own. And he actually takes pieces of Job and the Psalms, and a little bit from Isaiah's suffering servant, and he takes sort of pieces of those, and you'll sort of see the same verbiage, not, not necessarily quotes out of them, but it's the same sort of weeping and sadness that you see in Job, where Job is saying, you know, and where Psalms is saying, why did you forsake me, and that sort of thing. And then um, in the middle of this person, in Lamentations 3, this suffering man, all of a sudden, you sort of see this glimmer of hope, which is in Lamentations 3, 22 to 25. And it says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. And I say to myself, The Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him and to those who search for him. And it's just sort of this, like just in the middle of this suffering and horribleness and sadness, all of a sudden you see this wonderful hope in God. And it made me think, I was going to sing tonight, but I, I'll spare you. But we used to sing this song, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are never come to an end. Um, so I just thought it was sort of a nice thing right in the middle of all this sadness. Here's this song of hope. And then Lamentations 4 and 5. Lamentations 4 sort of relives this whole period of time where the siege was happening in Jerusalem. And it basically sh sort of shows these contrasting things. And it would say, like, well, before your children were this, and now they're begging, and now they're out on the street, and now you have no food. Before, when things were good, this is what you had, and this is how you were. But now, you, you know, it's a horrible place to be. And then Lamentations 5, I just thought was interesting. It's almost like a group lament. It's a, it's a group of people lamenting for one another and also lamenting for, you know, just the whole thing. But they really are starting to say, like, we are in this together, and we are all so sad together. Interesting. And then um, at the end of chapter 5, it sort of ends, the whole thing ends with what they would call a paradox, where he says, you, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. But why do you always forget us? Why do you always forsake us? Why, please restore us to yourself, Lord, that may, we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you're angry with us. So even in the same sentences, he's sort of saying like, you know, your mercies endure forever and you reign forever, but are you sure you're going to come back and get for us? Or are you sure you still love us? You've, you, have you rejected us or have you not rejected us? So it just sort of ends with this weirdness of they're still not really sure what's going to happen here. So are they really going to get forgiven or are they, you know, really, truly not good? So that's really all I had for Lamentations. It's just sort of sad.
well, it's, he's King Nebuchadnezzar now. So King Nebuchadnezzar, well, it might be the general. I don't know when he became king and all that. But he basically came down once and sort of said, you need to start, we're going to take you over. But he didn't take them captive. So he let them stay there for a period of time under King Zedekiah and under that governor that he put in place. And then the next time, um, the next time he came back, it did not go well for Zedekiah. And I didn't read this, but basically, oh, yeah, no. Basically, King Zedekiah, when he comes back to take him, he says, um, first, we're gonna watch, first you're going to watch us kill your kids, and then we're going to poke your eyes out and take you to Babylon. And that's what they did. They said, we want the last thing that you see to be um, your kids getting killed. So, yes, yes. So Jesus in Lamentations, um, this was sort of tough. <laughs> um, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, just like Jeremiah and just like the Lamentations. And that's in Luke 19, 41 to 44. And I felt like, you know, we also need to mourn over sin. I think there's a difference. You know, we, we sort of say, like, God, forgive us, or God, you know, we want to repent. But do we really mourn over our sin? Probably not as much as we need to, right? And that's in 1 John 1, 9. We need to mourn over sin and asking the Lord to forgive us because he is faithful and just. To forgive us. And then the other thing I just thought about was the temple, where Jesus talks about that he, the temple is going to be destroyed, but will be raised again in three days. And of course, people say that's heresy. You know, like, who, who do you think you are? Like, how dare you say that? But really, the temple was destroyed in this time. Jesus, uh, Jesus was the temple, right? And he was destroyed. And in three days, he was raised up. Now, it wasn't three days that they got their new temple, but they did get another temple after this, and that was destroyed too, but, or maybe it's going to be. Is that the one? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Not as lavish. It wasn't all gold like Solomon. So that's what I had for tonight. Do you guys have any questions or comments? It's like a sad night. <laughs> I was even like, I was thinking like, you can't even make this like fun. You know, like this is just not one of those things that you can make fun. It was not a fun week. <laughs> no party favors tonight. Um, so next week, we are going to do Ezekiel and Daniel. And that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be interesting too, because they are both like, power packed and so that's going to be fun to try and get all that done and then the week following the 26th is when we don't have class okay that's it thank you thank you you've been so faithful all of you thanks for coming